I study environmental science. Uh, sometimes that carries a lot of baggage, though. But let me assure you, I'm not, I'm not a hippie, nor am I a vegan. I don't even drive a hybrid. But one time, in one of my environmental science classes, uh, we had to take a quiz. And for this quiz, we needed to use a sheet of scratch paper. And we took the quiz, and when the class was over, I stood up, and on the way out, I threw the sheet of paper in the trash can. Now, as you can imagine, in an environmental science class, this was taboo. So I got statements like, Mitchell, I thought you were trying to, to save the world. You study environmental science, and uh, I thought you loved trees. Uh, why don't you recycle that sheet of paper? And I said, OK, OK, you're right. I took it out of the trash can, brought it home with me, and slipped it into the nearest recycling bin. But that had me thinking, uh, why do we recycle? And for, for many of you, you probably know the benefits of recycling, whether they be uh, to reduce the amount of energy uh, that it takes to make new materials or reduce the uh, amount of material that actually makes its way to a landfill. I personally started recycling because my parents did it. And so we had a bin like this. Uh, you may have had one yourself at your home. or may have one currently. Uh, maybe you have one that rolls out. And we would put all of our materials into this bin We'd bring it out to the front yard, put it there, and somebody would come by, pick it up, and magically our recycled materials were gone, and somehow we felt like we were saving the world. Somehow we felt like we were doing some social good. But uh, for my parents, it was a little different. Uh, they had a really bad case of being aggressive recyclers. They wanted to recycle everything. And so anything that moderately resembled a recyclable material would find its way into a bin like this. What I realized later, though, was that the rules of recycling are complex uh, from the consumer side, can be complex and confusing. So for example, plastics are separated into seven different types for recycling purposes. Plastic number one, like uh, water bottles and soda bottles, are generally recyclable everywhere. Uh, plastic number three is PVC material, PVC pipe. And uh, plastic number seven, for example, is that really thick plastic that makes up those five-gallon water jugs and uh, plastic baby bottles. Depending on where you live and where, you, uh, where your house is uh, at, those different plastics may or may not be recyclable. So it's very local. It's very regional. And so for my family, what we were actually doing was, was probably more harm than good. We threw everything into that recycling bin, including the, the famous example of the greasy pizza box, where many of you may know uh, you're not supposed to recycle greasy pizza boxes, by the way. But uh, we would still recycle that because it resembled a recyclable material. And so with our recyclable materials, uh, they would get to a plant like this after they were brought by the uh, recycle truck. Here they'd be sorted by uh, people as well as machines. And from plants like this, we get some really staggering statistics. First. 20% of uh, recycled materials, processed materials, excuse me, end up going to a landfill anyway. And so as materials would make their way through this plant, about 20% of that ends up having to be thrown away. Why, why does this happen? Well, people like, like my family, for example, who would pollute the recycle stream uh, with products that aren't actually recyclable uh, would decrease the quality of those materials that come out of the plant. Um, and they would not be up to uh, the standards to be used for new materials. Uh, second, paper fibers can only be recycled up to seven times. So that piece of paper that I threw away in my environmental science class ultimately is going to make its way to a landfill anyway. Lastly, 91% of plastics do not get recycled. And so this number is worldwide. However, we produce so much plastic, we produce so much uh, material around the world, but a lot of this never makes its way to a plant anyway, because uh, some cities, states, countries don't have a lot of emphasis put on recycling. And so, uh, what are we actually doing? Well, recycling sort of delays the inevitable. Uh, this material is going to make its way to a landfill anyway. And so, contrary to popular belief, recycling may not be as good as most of us think it is. Uh, if you're still skeptical like I was, 40,000 plastic bottles, that's, that's the number of bottles that it takes to offset a single flight from New York to London. So if I book a flight 
from New York to London. I use one seat on that plane. The plane uses a certain amount of fuel, and it creates a certain amount of carbon emissions. To offset that amount uh, from recycling, you'd have to recycle 40,000 plastic bottles. Uh, even more staggering is 100,000 plastic bottles. That's the number you'd have to recycle to offset that same flight, but if you booked a first class seat. So because you take up more room with your seat, technically you're using more fuel, and you'd have to recycle more than double the number of plastic bottles to offset those carbon emissions. Really staggering, really interesting. And so uh, what I figured is that recycling is the Western world's sort of feel-good solution to an unmanageable waste problem. Uh, we, we feel good when we recycle because it has a green component to it, and we feel like our waste problem really isn't a problem, generally. And recycling does two things uh, here in the Western world. It first reduces research, innovation, and investment in new technologies. So because we have recycling as this sort of crutch solution, because we use it as this temporary uh, solution, we don't necessarily need to allocate our resources to find new solutions. Uh, there's no pressure to, there's no incentive to. Second, it justifies overproduction and overconsumption um, of goods. And so because we have, again, this crutch solution for our waste, actually uh, we can essentially use more, and that's how most people feel. We see this with, with hybrids where generally people will drive more miles because the fuel is not solely uh, gasoline. And so this was looked at by a professor at uh, Boston University where he had a group of people, a sample, and he split them into two groups. In group A, he had them wrap a present in the presence of a trash can. And in group B, he had them wrap, he had them wrap that same present uh, near a recycling bin. As it turns out, uh, two to three times more material, uh, materials were used when in the presence of a recycling bin. Really, uh, really interesting there. Second, he had them, uh, another group of people take a math test using scratch paper. And one in the presence of a trash can, the other group in the presence of a recycling bin, and again, the same results. Two to three times more material uh, just being near a recycling bin. And so you might, you might have seen this yourself. You might, you might experience this when you go to like a fast food restaurant, or uh, you might be the person, or you might have a friend or a family member who after you order, you come back to the table and you grab the infamous uh, stack of 20 napkins at least, right? Maybe even more, uh, just for a single meal. It's really interesting that, that recycling, you might, you might grab this, these, this stack of napkins for, for many reasons, but there's no doubt that recycling has a sort of uh, underlying influence on many of our lives. And so this brings me to this quote, the responsibility of recycling, of waste, excuse me, needs to shift from consumer to producer. Uh, this is a really great quote. Um, it's by me, actually. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> I like this because in the Western world, we don't want to stop consuming. We don't want to limit our consumption. It would affect our lives uh, negatively. And we'd have to change our daily habits. So I think that to change those daily habits of people, of millions and millions of people, is incredibly difficult and won't happen quick enough to make a drastic change uh, in, our, in the waste industry. However, if that responsibility shifts to the producer, so instead of me having to figure out, sort my waste, figure out what plastics are and aren't recyclable, if the producer had that responsibility to produce friendly, environmentally friendly goods rather than uh, what was produced now, then I wouldn't necessarily have to worry about that. And how do, we, how do we start to do that? Well, first, we need to design our waste. So there's so much thought that goes into figuring out how a product looks on a shelf, how a product interacts with a user, how the product influences the, the actual, um, how the materials, excuse me, affect the actual product and the experience of the user. But hardly ever is it thought about uh, what happens to that product after the consumer is done. When the consumer throws this away or, or recycles perhaps, uh, what happens to the, the material then? Well, somebody who thinks about this and is, is going in the, in the right direction is Eco Products, where they're creating seemingly plastic uh, vessels for food, but they're all made out of plant material. So uh, corn, potato starch, sugar cane, their plastic vessels that hold food can actually just be composted and, and thrown out, and they'll be completely uh, biodegradable. 
Second, we need to change our views on consumption. Again, I don't believe that millions and millions of people will reduce their consumption habits uh, enough to make a drastic change on our waste, uh, unmanageable waste problem. But if we can change the process surrounding consumption and the process of how we consume uh, goods, then that's where the drastic change will come from. A company who does this well is out of Germany where they have small scale markets that use no single use plastic. So never will you find a plastic water bottle that needs to be thrown out or a plastic, plastic packaging material that needs to be thrown away after a single use. Rather, they have fruits in the front, staple foods like beans, rice, and pasta in the back where you bring your own vessel, fill that vessel, and pay for the amount of food that you got. Simple solution, great step in the right direction. And lastly, we need to learn and spread the word. So I myself, as a single student, may not have the power, have the influence, the connections to make this change. But if each of us, me included, and you as well, start to spread the word to people who do have this power, to people who can make this change, whether it be politics, uh, through big business leaders, through small business owners, start to shift to, to new products, different solutions than recycling, then that's when the change will start to be made. Now, you may be asking, after this talk, should you go recycle? Should I still recycle that water bottle? Uh, yes, in the short term, you should. Unfortunately, recycling is sort of this necessary evil, if you will, that has to happen until we transition to a better, more permanent solution. The same way that we still have to frack oil uh, domestically in the United States before we reach renewable energy, we have to keep recycling until we find a better solution. But if there is one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk, it's that recycling is not the solution to our waste problem. If we can start doing those three things mentioned before, designing our waste, changing our views on consumption and the process surrounding consumption, and learning and spreading this word to those people who do have this power to change it, and together, hopefully, we will all stop recycling. Thanks.